Wonderful. Welcome everyone to Water in the Garden, which is the second part of a three-part webinar series from the Master Gardener program that we're calling Growing Season Webinars. We are excited to have you here today to talk about water, both water saving techniques and also water features in the garden. Just a few pieces um, just to show you where we're going today. We're going to start with a water-wise garden presentation, which will be 55 minutes long. We'll take a five-minute break and then we'll jump into water features. So just a couple notes. This is not a live presentation, so unfortunately we have no chat box where you can ask a question. However, we are providing the email addresses of our speakers, Denny Schrock and Jamie Beyer today, so please feel free to send them an email if a question pops up for you. And also that we are taking time for you to have discussions within your rooms. So we're going to give you a little bit of time to discuss some particular questions and if you can get into small groups it would be helpful uh, whether that's a group of three or five that'll be helpful for those discussions. In terms of handouts we've got a few handouts for you today from our speakers and these will just help you help guide you through the presentation give you a resource after the presentation and then also we have an evaluation so please give us feedback on what's working well with this presentation and also what you would change so please feel free to fill out the evaluation form and hand that to your host at the end of the presentation also a reminder that this does count towards your continuing education hours which is a requirement of 10 hours a year so please uh, after you've gained these two hours of continuing education, run and jump onto our hours reporting website and enter your information. Well, I'm pleased to say that we have one more webinar in this series coming up, so please join us next time. We're going to be talking about pollinators and growing herbs, and that one is going to be available later on this summer, so please feel free to join us next time. I'm excited to hand it over to Denny Schrock. He's going to be speaking to you about water-wise landscaping. Um, so, yes, welcome to our presentation on water-wise landscaping. Now, uh, one term that's sometimes used for water-wise landscaping is xeriscaping. Um, I purposefully avoided using the term xeriscaping for two reasons. One, it's trademarked by the Denver Water Board. And secondly, um, too many people think xeriscaping is zero-scaping, meaning there's nothing to it. Well, there are lots of things that are involved in water-wise landscaping. And as you can see here, it doesn't mean that we're planting a desert. All of the plants you see in this opening slide are good water-wise plants for the Midwest. We have a lot of ornamental grasses, a lot of prairie plants like the purple coneflower and liatris, but we'll get to that as to what we're going to be looking at when we're thinking of water-wise landscaping. What I'd like to have you come away with from this presentation, at least one thing that you come away with, would be to know what the basic principles of water-wise landscaping are. And you can see those enumerated here, and we'll be talking about each of these in more detail, so you don't necessarily need to get them all committed to memory right now. But uh, if you go through this list, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about, about how you design for water conservation. There's a big difference in the way plants are laid out in the landscape as to how much water they need or how much water might be used or how efficiently you're irrigating things. Secondly, improving soils. Now, if all of Iowa was still good prairie soil, we wouldn't even have to mention this one. But most of us live in landscapes where we've had altered soil horizons. The, perhaps the subsoil has been dug up and spread out over your yard and now you don't have good topsoil anymore. You've got subsoil for growing plants. So we're going to talk about how we improve those soils for better water-wise use. Third is limiting turf, and I always have to be a little cautious when I talk about this one because there's usually a couple lawn jockeys in the audience who say, you're going to get rid of the grass. No, we're not talking about eliminating grass. What we're talking about is making a, a wise choice about how much turf we're going to use in the landscape because turf is one of the higher water use areas. Fourth, we're talking about using adapted plants. Now, um, one of those 
groups might be native plants, but there are also many other plants that may be from other areas of the world with similar climates that would be well adapted to our landscapes here in the Midwest. Fifth is mulching appropriately, and we'll talk about what's good mulch and bad mulch or how to do it. Um, irrigating efficiently, and you know we could talk an hour about just irrigation, but uh, we're going to uh, slide over that in just a, a, a few minutes. And then seventh, providing timely maintenance. Um, it's the old adage of a stitch in time saves nine, and uh, plants that are maintained well are going to be less stressed and have less need for water. So let's take a look first here about designing for water conservation. One of the, the major points about designing for water conservation is you want to group the plants by water need. So it, it certainly doesn't make sense to plant a fern next to a yucca. Uh, we know that ferns like lots of moisture, shade, yuccas like it hot and dry. If you plant them next to each other, one or, or the other, or maybe both, are going to suffer. So what we talk about is putting the plants that have similar water needs together in a, a particular point of the landscape. Now, uh, you can see a couple landscape designs there. One is just a black and white drawing. The other is a, a colorized drawing that shows kind of swaths of plants. And what we would think about would be perhaps all the plants in one particular swath might either be low water plants or they might be high water use plants so that we can water them all at the same time and uh, giving them the amount that they need. I kind of alluded to this already that we put those plants into various water use zones and sort of arbitrarily we place them into three water use zones. The first of those, since we're talking about water wise landscaping, the first is going to be our low water use zone. This is the one where you really water it only during the establishment period. One misconception about water wise landscaping is if we put in water tolerant plants we don't ever have to water them. That's not exactly true. Virtually every plant, even the low water use ones, are going to need some water during their establishment period. Now that establishment period is not just the first two weeks they're out in the garden either. Um, think about it two or possibly even three years as their establishment period. So on the left here we can see a tree that has a tree gator bag around the trunk. Uh, this is a tree that's been recently planted and rather than trying to stand out there with the hose watering it, uh, put this tree gator bag on so it'll drip the water out to the root zone and not run off. Um, and we may need to do this, as I said, for the first couple years of establishment of that tree. However, after the establishment period, if it's a low water use plant, it shouldn't need any additional water. So on the right, you see one of my driveway gardens um, that has a southeast facing slope, and this doesn't get any additional water after I've had it established. So you can see a few things in there. The yucca is quite prominent, the variegated yucca, uh, one that's got a big root system and never is going to need uh, watering. Uh, to its left, there's a little prickly pear cactus, uh, some junipers there. Uh, Maltese cross is the orange flowered one and some daylilies you can see blooming in the background. There's some shrubs in the back. Uh, one of those is a uh, flowering quince with glossy leaves, doesn't need any watering, and there's a, a big uh, silvery foliaged artemisia back there too. So all of these plants need no water after they've been established, so they all fit in the low water use zone. The medium water use zone <coughs> are those plants that are like the low water ones going to need some watering during establishment, but we also break down and water them when we have protracted droughts. Um, these are, you know, perhaps we have, uh, when I lived in Missouri, we always had the six week summer drought. Um, we pretty much count on it. The rain would stop about the first of July and not hit again until late August. So we would know that sometime during that, that time frame, we're going to have to water most of our plants in our landscape. And the ones you see here are all good for that, that purpose. We've got some uh, scabiosa on the far left, the purplish flowered ones. We've got some betony, some lamb's ear. Um, uh, actually, both of these slides or pictures are from the same garden. Um, you can see that rose arbor in both 
images and it just kind of extends along. So we've got some lilies blooming there, some irises, some uh, alliums or ornamental onions. There's also some echinacea in there. So all of these are, are good plants for that medium water use zone. Most of the time, most years uh, don't need any extra water, but if we have a dry extended period, we may need to give them a little bit of water. Then there's the third area of the landscape, the high water use zone. And that high water use zone is the one where you give the plants water as they need it. Um, typically, when we're talking about water-wise landscaping, this should be a smaller portion of the landscape than the other two. But you may have those spots in the landscape where you want to give a little wow factor. And so you know, by, by the front door, perhaps, or along the walkways we see on the left there, you want to keep those annual flowers looking at their best. Um, you don't want to have to, to try to hide the little browning of the leaf edges because they're, they're suffering from water damage. And also, you see on the far right, our vegetable gardens. Uh, if we're going to keep our vegetables productive, we have to keep them well hydrated. So we give the vegetable garden the water it needs to keep them productive. So all those plants would be in a high water use zone, but typically that's a smaller portion of the landscape than the other two zones. One other thing that we often may not think about as we're designing for water conservation is to avoid heat sinks. By heat sinks, I mean uh, hardscape areas or rocky type areas that are going to uh, collect the heat of the sun. Um, it, it stands to reason that uh, if you've ever put your hand on a rock wall in midsummer on a sunny day, you know that it heats up a lot and that emits that heat and can dry out the plants nearby much more than if it is shaded. It also makes it a lot more comfortable for us to be a part of that landscape. So on the left, you see there a, a wrought iron bench in the shade of a tree. Well, if we had that patio area without the tree, that's going to be a hot, sunny area and unpleasant to sit in. But as it is now with the shade of the tree, it's going to be cooler and uh, uh, conserves moisture so we don't have to water as much, especially after it's just rained, as you can see in the picture, where it's still wet. On the right, there's a, a pergola with vines climbing over it. Those vines are uh, also not a tree, but they do provide shade and cool the area for uh, sitting there underneath that pergola. Our second point here is improving soils. And the, the point I want to make here at first is that you need to dig deeply. Although roots of most plants are going to be primarily in the top foot of soil, the deeper you can uh, till the soil and provide an open space for roots to penetrate, the deeper the roots will go and the uh, less frequently you'll have to water them. On the left there, uh, I'm showing you what passes for a typical yard in central Missouri. Um, uh, there are places here in Iowa, I'm sure, that, that look similar to this too, with a lot of limestone and clay. Um, not the best for plant growth, so we need to do something to amend those soils. On the right, you can see me uh, starting a new garden that I started earlier this spring. Um, I use what I call a double digging technique. I kill off all the sod in the area and then I dig as deeply as I can with one shovel spade's depth, go through, add my compost, and dig it again. So I probably end up with at least a good foot of rooting zone for the plants that I put in there. And it, it uh, fluffs up the soil a bit, uh, adds more oxygen to the soil, and I usually end up with essentially a raised bed that's about six inches higher than the surrounding soil by doing that. I kind of alluded to this already that the, the way we're going to improve those soils uh, beyond just digging them is to add some organic matter to the soil. Uh, on the left there you can see, perhaps you can see a little outline of white uh, lime that is marking out a bed with a bunch of compost piled there ready to, to work into the soil and make a raised bed. On the route, Right is a uh, gardener's dream, a pile of composted horse manure. Um, that's a, a great way to add some organic matter to the soil too. So you know, whatever you have available to you, but that organic matter is the uh, magic elixir, if you will, for amending soils. Now, uh, I probably should also put a caution in here that 
you have to think big when you do it. Um, you may have seen or heard of instances where uh, it's recommended that you do not add organic matter to the planting hole of a, a tree or shrub you plant. And yes, that's true. If you're just doing it in a small area where the root of the plant is going in, essentially what you're doing is you're creating a larger pot to put the plant in. But I'm talking about amending large beds where the roots can extend in all directions and uh, improve the soil that way. So you don't want to amend just a little bit, do it a lot. As Mae West said, nothing succeeds like excess. <laughs> a third point in uh, our water-wise landscaping is to limit those turf areas. And a great way to do that is by using ground covers of various sorts. Um, it doesn't have to be a solid ground cover across the, uh, the, the lawn. As you can see on the left there, it may be a mix of various perennials that sort of serve as ground covers. Uh, in this case, kind of mixed in with some boulders to create a, a rock garden effect. Um, but there are many, many perennials, low growing perennials, that can work quite well as ground covers in the landscape. Uh, in the center there, it's a combination of sedum sarmentosum and uh, Campanula glomerita or uh, um, clustered bellflower. Um, both of those are actually pretty aggressive spreaders and by planting them next to each other, that's, they sort of fight it out and don't uh, overtake anything else. Um, this is a little bit farther down the driveway from where you saw earlier with my yucca and so on. Uh, so it's bounded by the driveway on one side, a sidewalk on the other, so they can't spread into the yard and take over other things. So do be cautious about aggressive ground covers that may spread beyond where you want them to. Uh, so make some way to limit them. Uh, the far right is a little low growing ground cover called Potentilla vernanana, a little low creeping sink foil. Uh, blooms with these yellow flowers through much of the spring, never gets more than two or three inches tall. I do find that it sometimes self seeds a little bit beyond the spite I wanted, but it's mostly a creeping type ground cover that only spreads a little bit every year. And if you don't want it to pop up where it self seeds, you can easily pull those out. But this is a type of ground cover which I would call a steppable or a walkable. Um, it's not one you would want to put out for uh, a, a turf area where you're playing football or baseball all the time, but it doesn't matter if you walk across this occasionally. Um, it'll spring back pretty readily, and there are actually, uh, I, I use the term steppable, that's actually again a trademarked name of a whole brand of low growing ground covers that can be used and, and used uh, for walking on. So my, my dream at some point is to uh, add another big bed in my front yard because it's a southeast facing slope and dries out a lot. I'm going to have a big oval bed of steppable ground covers instead of grass there. I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, Another way to limit those turf areas in your landscape is by installing hardscapes. A couple benefits here. First of all, as you can see, they create wonderful outdoor living spaces. So if you would like to have a water garden, which Jamie Beyer will tell you a lot more about a little bit later uh, on in the presentation today, um, you can see the water garden there in the foreground uh, attached with a little brick walkway back to a patio fire pit area. Uh, both of those are little seating areas that make wonderful outdoor uh, living spaces in my backyard. Um, and the other one on the right is a, a patio or terrace area. And actually, if you look closely, there's actually two outdoor living spaces. There's a little balcony up above that overlooks the, the patio or terrace below. Um, both of those are great outdoor living spaces. And of course, the plants there don't need any extra water. The ones in the water garden are self-watering pretty well. <laughs> Um, the other thing to, to keep in mind there, when you have these hardscape spaces, is they create some water runoff. So actually it's not a bad idea to have plants that may need a little extra water right next to those hardscape spaces because they're going to get that extra water. Um, it will flow off from the uh, hardscape into the, the surrounding soil. So that's a, a good way to maybe use your high water use zone next to the hardscape. A third uh, concept here in the limiting the turf areas are trying uh, or using low water use turf grasses. 
Not for everyone, of course, but uh, we know that if we're growing bluegrass in Iowa, in most summers when we have our dry period, the bluegrass is going to go dormant unless you water it quite regularly. Now, for some, that may not be a problem. I tend to let my bluegrass go dormant and not really a problem. It'll come back in the fall again. Uh, on a severe drought year, you may have to water a little bit just to keep the crowns alive, uh, not keeping it green. But there are other turf grass options that don't need nearly as much water as bluegrass. On the left is uh, tall fescue. The foreground you can see with a little bit coarser look to it is a common type tall fescue, uh, like K31, which is only a slight improvement over some of the pasture grasses. But behind it, that's also a tall fescue. So you can see breeders have made some vast improvements in the, the turf type quality of tall fescues. And tall fescues definitely need less water than bluegrass. So that might be an option for you if you're looking for a cool season grass that will stay green through the summer with little water. In the middle, we have zoysia grass. Um, for some, that might be a weed. Um, because it's a warm season grass, it will not wa uh, green up until uh, things warm up in the springtime, and it will turn brown with the first frost or freezes of the fall. So if that's not what you want, zoysia grass is probably not going to be a good choice for you. But it certainly is a lower water use grass. The third one on the right, which you can see has a little bit uh, rougher texture to it, is buffalo grass. This is a native grass uh, that works well in low water use areas uh, and needs very little mowing. You can mow it once a month because it's not going to get very tall. Its major drawback, uh, somewhat like zoysia grass, it's a warm season grass, so it turns brown early in the fall, is late to green up in the spring. Um, and it does, because it's a, a, a not as vigorous a grower, tends to develop a few more weed problems than some of the other turf type grasses. But if you're looking for a real low maintenance grass, it might be an option for you. The fourth point, we want to talk about using adapted plants. And here we need to think about the microclimates you have in your particular landscape. Um, those of you who have heard my perennials talks probably have seen this slide before or one very similar to it, looking at uh, a couple spots in my yard that are not very far apart. The one on the left with a brick wall is um, my side load garage that faces, though the wall faces to the southeast. And so that's a real hot, dry, sunny area there. Um, between the sidewalk and the brick wall. Both of those things are going to be throwing off a lot of heat. Um, so I have to plant uh, plants that are going to take that sort of excess heat and low water uh, use in this little narrow bed. So I've got Amsonia, I've got some cat mint, I've got a crepe myrtle and um, Vernonia, uh, which is uh, a, a good uh, plant for, for low water use. Then just around the corner of the garage, I have what uh, for many years constituted my only shade garden. <laughs> um, because it was a, a new landscape, there weren't trees big enough to really cast shade. I do now have the, uh, there's a uh, Coosa dogwood there that you may see on the far right that's gotten at least 10 feet tall. So it's beginning to cast a little bit of shade in the shade garden too. But the shade really comes from the garage wall itself, uh, because this is on the, the northeast side of the garage. So you can see here the hostas and the stillbees, and we've got some ladies' mantles, some ajuga, and hydrangea, all doing quite nicely in this uh, microclimate that's really less than 100 feet away from the, the uh, one on the left. So I often like to say I've got San Antonio around the corner from Minneapolis. In using adapted plants, a good idea is to, to look at the, the native plants. So I'm hearing say, go native. Um, at the far left there with the little red-winged blackbird is sitting in a, a reconstituted prairie with some gray-headed coneflower and some purple prairie clover uh, with, along with the uh, prairie grasses. Now, you may not have a spot in your yard that is well adapted to uh, a native prairie um, because 
a front yard that gets six feet tall sometimes doesn't commit to codes. Um, so you may have to do a little little education of, of your uh, city fathers or, or mothers uh, as to what uh, you're, you're doing there. But if you've got a large area, those native prairie plants might be a, a good option. Uh, see some more of them there in the, the center. There's the uh, orange of the butterfly milkweed, the uh, black-eyed Susan, and the purple coneflower. Um, these, of course, you don't really have to establish a native prairie to put them in. They're all wonderful plants just as ornamentals individually, so you can put these in a perennial border just as nicely as you can in a, a prairie. And if you really need some shorter ones, there are some other short native prairie plants too, like the one on the right, which is the prairie smoke, Geum triflorum, blooms early in the springtime uh, with the nodding pink buds and flowers that develop the hairy or feathery seed pods that you see here. Um, this one, even with the seed pods, never gets more than about a foot tall. So virtually any landscape can, can handle that. Another thought as you're developing those adapted plants is to look at those plants that have silver or gray foliage. Um, virtually every silver foliage plant is a good low water use plant. Why? Well, I'll answer my own question there. <laughs> um, the reason being is they, the reason that they actually have a silvery coloration to them is they are covered in hairs. That may be real evident on the lamb's ears in the middle there where the bumblebee is uh, attracted to the flowers. You can see uh, you know, almost the woolly nature of it. Uh, the dusty miller on the left, you have to look a little bit closer, but yes, there are white or silvery hairs all over that foliage. And likewise on the lavender at the far right, those are silvery hairs that, that create that uh, silvery pattern. What those hairs do on the uh, epidermal surface of these plants is they tend to trap the water next to the foliage uh, that the plants are transpiring. So when they're photosynthesizing, they, they lose naturally lose some water. But in this case, the water is or humidity is trapped right next to the, the leaf. And so they're a little bit more efficient on water usage. And that makes them low water use plants. Step number five, mulch appropriately. Do it right. <laughs> So what do we mean by doing it right? Well, uh, here in the Midwest in particularly, I think that organic mulches are your best option. Um, you'll certainly see many landscapes that use river rock or gravel as a, a mulch around plants. And while that can hold in some moisture, it is much like the hardscape in that it's going to build up heat and actually in effect reduce the amount or, uh, or increase the amount of water use of the plants that are planted near it. So not the best option for uh, a mulch here in the Midwest. So these organic mulches that you see in this slide, we've got wood chips on the left, uh, we've got grass clippings in the center, and we've got pine needles or pine straw on the far right. Um, Bark nuggets are also a, a good option for or organic mulches. What these organic mulches do is uh, there are several things that, that are advantageous for, with the use of organic mulches. One is over time they're going to break down and decay and add additional organic matter to the soil underneath them. Uh, as we said earlier in the presentation, that organic matter helps loosen up the soil and provide a better rooting zone for the plants in which uh, the uh, where they're growing, where the mulch is located. Um, secondly, as most mulches do if applied properly, they're going to prevent weed growth or at least minimize the weed growth. They're going to prevent some evaporative loss of water from the soil so it'll cut down on the amount of water needed by the plant. And uh, I think it also just helps make a prettier looking <laughs> planting. It, it does a little finishing touch there. So how do we apply the, that mulch? 
it of course depends on the type of planting we're using. We saw in the previous slide around uh, perennial plants, uh, you pretty much have to scatter it throughout the planting. Uh, you do, however, as with trees, want to avoid piling the mulch up around the main stem or trunk of the, the plant. On the far left, we can see a tree uh, which is mulch that's been piled that looks like at least a foot deep around the trunk. We don't see any root flare, the, the, the movement of the uh, trunk kind of flaring out at the base, which should be evident. So what happens when you pile mulch up around the trunk like this is you can develop rot at the trunk, a collar rot. Um, and uh, so you, you want to pull that mulch away from the trunk a bit more like we see on the right where you've got a shallow wide range of mulch. Uh, the farther out you can put the mulch the better. There's less competition from the root zone of the, the grass uh, competing with moisture of the tree, so the, the wider the better. Point number six, irrigating efficiently. Um, we might do that by recycling rainwater. Some years here in the Midwest, we may not need any supplemental water, but most years we're going to need a little bit. A uh, couple ways you can do this. On the left, we see a rain garden. Um, not evident in the photo, but the rainwater off the roof uh, is funneled underground and comes out in a little low depression in the middle of this uh, area that we see with these native prairie type plants. And so when there's excess rain, it's captured in the rain garden and gradually soaks into the ground rather than running off site. So that's a good way to make use of that excess water. On the right, we see a couple of rain barrels. And uh, most people don't realize how many rain barrels they need to capture all the water off their roof uh, because it, it fills up pretty quickly. Just to give you an idea, I've got a, a few calculations here to show you. So how much water are you going to get off your roof? So there's a couple or several different uh, square foot areas there on the right. So the, the lowest one uh, with the darkest line and the little squares, like that's an 800 square foot roof. The biggest one is 1,500 square foot, so almost twice as much. So with a one inch rainfall, we can see at 800 inches, you're going to get almost 500 gallons. And with a one inch rainfall on a 1,500 square foot roof, you'll get, it's probably closer to about 800 uh, gallons off of that roof. Uh, it takes a lot of rain barrels to, to capture all that rain. So you do need to have an overflow if you're going to have that. So uh, uh, this last week in my place, I had seven inches of rain in one week or one day. So um, I probably would have needed a, a lot of rain barrels to, to capture all that runoff. Efficient irrigation, uh, we're going to use trickle or drip irrigation primarily throughout the landscape. So we see a soaker hose uh, on the left there uh, oozing water out. And on the right, it's a, another type of drip irrigation. This is one of those hoses that have little holes in them throughout the, uh, the length of the hose. And you can see it's kind of snaked back and forth through the planting. The idea being here is you want to get the water uh, delivered right to the root zone of the plant. You don't get the foliage wet and that way you uh, cut down on the amount of disease problems and you don't lose any water to e evaporation. So we want you to avoid wasteful watering. Um, too often we see the uh, overhead sprinkler as we see in the far left there. Uh, good way to cover a lot of area in watering at, at the same time, but you lose a lot of water through evaporation. So if you do have to use this method, best to use it very early in the morning uh, because wind speeds tend to be lower at that time. And it also allows the foliage to dry before nightfall and uh, cut down on the amount of disease problems. On the right, you see me supervising my granddaughter, Catherine, uh, with her hand watering. Um, and of course, I do let her spritz a little extra here and there, but the idea is that you may have to do some hand watering occasionally. Uh, so uh, we may find that even though we have our plants zoned by water use, there may be a, a spot or a plant that tends to dry out faster than the others around it. So using a little bit of hand watering like this is a good efficient way of uh, taking care of that problem. 
Our seventh and final uh, point is to provide timely maintenance. And by this, I'm looking at practicing preventive care. Uh, you know, if you, you keep things looking well, then they're going to be uh, non-stressed and, and growing well. So in the middle there, we see our master gardener out watching her flocks by day. Time for your groan. Um, <laughs> making sure that there's no pests on it. Uh, we often get calls from consumers or homeowners saying that my plant died overnight. I know it didn't. They just haven't been out observing the problems as they come along. We also can think about doing things like putting the chicken wire around the trunk of the tree to prevent rabbits from damaging the, the bark and thereby causing more stress to the plant. Timely maintenance also uh, comes into play when we're talking about lawns. So you want to mow high and mow frequently. Uh, in a wet year, that doesn't mean, that means you may have to mow more than once a week, maybe every three or four days or every five days. So go by how tall the grass is getting. Um, mow it high. Uh, most of our cool season grasses should be mowed at at least three or four inches in height through the heat of the summer to avoid stress to them. And you also mow frequently enough so that you're removing no more than a third of the grass blade at a time. If you see grass dried grass piling up on your lawn like you do on the right there, that means you waited too long to mow. Pruning properly is an important uh, timely maintenance factor. Um, the tree on the left uh, is in for a real problem. <laughs> it's got multiple leaders with included bark. That bark's kind of rolling in on itself and it's going to split apart and not be a good healthy tree. So take care of those pruning problems early on. We also want to try to maintain the natural shape of the plant as we're pruning. So the center one is actually a bridal respirea that should have a nice arching form to it. Uh, it's been pruned back into a little ball and you see it's trying to create arches again by putting out those new shoots. So you can prune and thin out to maintain or, or cut down on the amount of water use, but don't shear it into little meatballs, please. <laughs> Uh, on the far right, we see deadheading flowers. Um, this is something you may want to do because uh, formation of those seeds takes extra energy from the plant and that just uh, causes it to need more water to, to keep on growing. And of course, we also need to manage weeds in the landscape. All those weeds are competing with your desirable plants for the existing moisture that's there. So get rid of those weeds to cut down on the amount of water uh, that the uh, uh, existing plants need. And finally, limiting fertilization as a, a timely maintenance. Uh, too many people just go out and sprinkle fertilizer because they think the plants need it. So suggesting here that you take a soil test first to see what, if anything, is needed in your landscape. Um, many Iowa soils are, are so rich that we really don't need any extra phosphorus or nitrogen. We might need to apply a little bit of extra nitrogen. Um, but oftentimes we can supply that through organic matter because as organic matter breaks down it releases the nitrogen. So we've got some compost on the right. If you do need to use a commercial fertilizer consider using a spreader like we see in the center that has an edge guard to it. So you're only applying the fertilizer where it's needed not on the uh, perennial beds or on the sidewalk or driveway. Just keep it on the lawn where you're wanting that fertilizer to land. So we're now at the point for you to, to think about these uh, principles that we've been talking about and talk a little bit about which water-wise principles are you already using and what new technique or techniques that you uh, learned about that you might implement this year in your own yard or in one of your master gardener projects or community garden.
All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully you had a good discussion and some ideas of how you might put into practice some of the things we've talked about so far in the presentation. Now, I talk too much, so uh, in the remaining time we have here, we're going to talk or zip through the select water-wise plants. Now, I kind of guessed that I would run out of time, so that's why you have the list of all these plants right in front of you. You don't need to madly scribble their names down. I will try to zip through them, but I thought it would be helpful for you to see some of these water-wise plants. Uh, and I had a tough time limiting down to 30 genera. I couldn't just do 30 plants. I had to do 30 genera. So you can see here, we've got the yarrows or achillea. We've got the bright yellow coronation gold, strawberry seduction, which is part of a tutti frutti series. I love all those fern leaf yarrows. And then a little low creeping uh, achillea tomentosa or woolly yarrow with the bright yellow flowers. Makes a nice little ground cover. That's one of those steppable types of things. The agastaches, or agastaches, depending on how you pronounce that, um, are uh, wonderful plants for low water use as well. We see the uh, agastache canna on the left, which is sometimes called uh, hummingbird mint or double bubble mint because it smells a little like bubble gum and attracts hummingbirds. In the middle, you see the light airy look of the uh, agastache rupestris uh, with a little bit of an orange tinge to it. And then the uh, native one to the Midwest is the Agastache funiculum, the Anis hyssop. Now, all of the uh, Agastaches tend to be short-lived, but they also self-seed a bit. So if you like them to spread along, around a little bit, don't deadhead them right away, and they'll often pop back for you. Alliums, or nodding onions, um, uh, it, the nodding onion is the one on the far left, and you can see how it gets that name. It has a head that's kind of bent over. When it gets pollinated, the head pops straight up. In the center, the chives, and on the far right, the uh, keeled garlic, which looks like exploding fireworks to me. Uh, lots of the uh, ornamental onions. Like I only put a, th a few here. Uh, we could talk for a half hour just on the ornamental onions. But because they're bulbs, they store their own water source in the bulb, and they're great for low water use landscapes. The milkweeds uh, give the monarch butterflies a little uh, boost as well by planting some of the uh, uh, Asclepias tuberosa, the butterfly milkweed, or the common milkweed, the Asclepias syriaca, there in the center. Uh, just be cautioned that the uh, common milkweed does spread through rhizomes, so it can take over things if you don't keep it contained. And then I put a little different one there, the, uh, the uh, Asclepias variegata, um, which is a red ring milkweed. Um, doesn't have as glossy leaves as it looks there. That was taken during the rain. <laughs> But that's an, a lovely little one if you can find it. Baptisias, great, great plants. Uh, I use them as shrub substitutes because they get several feet tall very quickly in the springtime and then send out these lovely blue uh, panicles of blooms. A lot of hybridization has been taking place in, the, in recent years, so we can see the um, interspecific hybrids like the Twilight Prairie Blues in the center that is a deep purple with a, a gold edge to it, and the Carolina Moonlight on the right, which is a creamy yellow. Caryopteris, or Bluebeard, also sometimes called Blue Mist Spirea, uh, uh, is a, a woody plant, actually, that uh, is grown more like a herbaceous perennial here in Iowa because it tends to die back to the ground every year. Um, the uh, insects absolutely love this plant. In late summer, it will just be loaded with pollinating insects, so it's a great one to add. If you don't have a lot of space, the little petty blue in the middle there, only about a foot and a half tall at most, uh, is a good option to think about. And if you like a little bit of contrast, that summer sorbet with the uh, gold edge uh, to the foliage, even when it's not in bloom, is quite, quite attractive. The mountain bluet, or centaria, uh, the plain species on the left, a, a selection that has a purple center with white uh, ringed uh, petals is uh, amethyst in snow. Uh, both of those can spread pretty readily if you don't keep it in check, uh, but they're not quite like the bachelor's button annual that self-seeds everywhere. They just spread uh, by rhizomes. 
The far right is uh, Centauria macrocephala, which is sometimes called Armenian basket flower or big-headed uh, Centauria because those, those blooms are several inches in diameter. All great for low water use. The <coughs> Centranthus is sometimes called Red Valerian or Jupiter's beard. The uh, most common one is the the pink flowered form. There is a white flowered form as you see here and the common name of Jupiter's beard comes from its seed heads. When, the, uh, when it goes to seed it gets a white fluffy seed head that does tend to self seed which is a good thing because this is a short lived perennial and uh, just let it self seed and come back in its spot. Love that blue green foliage. In its native habitat in the Mediterranean they'll grow in rock outcropping so you know they're tough low water plants. <coughs> Excuse me. Dianthus is another Mediterranean native that grows in rock outcropping. So we've got the, uh, the one with a big, big mouthful of a name, Dianthus gratianopolitanus, um, which is the one on the far left, uh, common uh, cultivar name of fire witch. Um, blue green foliage, magenta pink blooms in uh, mid to late spring. There are others that look a little bit more like miniature carnations like Rachel in the center there about a foot tall with little miniature carnation like flowers and the sweet William Dianthus barbatus on the right which is actually a biennial so that's one too you want to let go to seed. The echinacea um, often commonly called purple coneflower I purposely just shortened the name to coneflower because many of them are no longer purple. Uh, there's a lot of hybrids out there that have pulled in yellows and reds and oranges but the ones I'm showing here are still the, the pinky purple. Uh, we have a, a little dwarf one the pixie meadow bright on the left was developed by Chicago Botanic Garden the, the CBG. Um, it's, it's only about two feet tall. We have echinacea tennesseense in the center which I absolutely love. The flowers always face east. Be, be aware of that uh, where you plant them. You don't want them where they're going to face your wall while they're blooming. Um, but they bloom longer than any of the other cone flowers that I know of. Uh, in my trials they've bloomed at least 20 weeks through the summer. And then there are some of the new cultivars that have various flower forms like the Southern Bell on the far right. I absolutely love that sort of pom-pom effect with the little ray florets coming out of it. Eryngium. We've got sea hollies and rattlesnake master here. There's the um, amethyst uh, sea holly on the far left, the big blue sea holly in the center. Differences there, the uh, amethyst ones, the individual flowers are only about an inch and a half or two in diameter. Big blue is really big blue, about four inches in diameter. And the rattlesnake master, same genus but different species, is a native prairie plant with those white prickly uh, uh, flowers and yucca like foliage. That's why the, the yucca folium. And yes the rattlesnake master name comes from uh, Native Americans did use it as a uh, uh, poultice against rattlesnake venom. Blanket flower or gallardia. Um, most of the cultivars are a little short ones only going to be about a foot to foot and a half tall. There are some of the native species that will get close to three feet tall and most have the uh, yellow and red bicolor florets. Um, there are some solid yellow ones like Mesa yellow here. There's also a solid red one called burgundy. Gypsophila or baby's breath uh, has the airy foliage with uh, uh, these little Yellow, or white to pink flowers. Uh, the pink fairy on the left is a very very delicate pink. You see it almost looks white. Uh, Festival star in the center is a little bit larger bloom than uh, the uh, pink fairy. And then there's also a creeping one called the Repens rosea with pink blooms. Daylilies. Um, daylilies are tough tough plants. If you can't get daylilies to grow give up. No, <laughs> I don't want to tell you that. But you literally can throw these out on the ground and almost don't have to plant them and they'll grow for you and bloom. Many, many cultivars available. Choose ones that are rebloomers like the early bird cardinal or ones with lots of uh, buds in each scape. Irises. A lot of different types of irises. The, some of the little bulbous ones like the reticulate iris there on the far left. The um, bearded iris in the center or um, Iris domestica which used to be called blackberry lily, Bellum candidensis, is now classified as an iris, is a, a fall bloomer with the uh, orange spotted uh, blooms. 
Uh, there are also irises that like a lot of water. So um, the iris sudacris, yellow and, and blue flag iris, the Japanese iris, like a lot of water. So choose your irises carefully, but many of them do like low water zones. Lavender, a great choice for low water use. That lovely, lovely fragrance of flowers and foliage. I see a few here, Dwarf Blue, Levance, and Hid Coat. Make sure you get ones that are hardy for Iowa. <clears throat> Linum or Flax. Um, the yellow flowered one is a little bit uncommon. It's a bell flower a flax that has these bell shaped flowers, bright yellow. Um, the western flax is the Perenne Luisii in the center. And the European one is just the straight Perenne Sapphire. All of them great for low water use. Many of the Miscanthus, maiden grasses. We see the uh, fine foliage of Gracilimus on the left, the uh, coarser foliage with the striping of zebra grass in the center, and the purpurescence or uh, uh, flame grass on the right. And you can see how it gets that name in the fall, that sort of purplish and orange flaming color to it, especially with a low setting sun in the fall. Catmints, Nepeta, great, great plant. Uh, they do tend to self-seed, especially the lower ones, so you may want to deadhead them occasionally so they don't spread all over the place. There's Facinii and Rangsamosa, Walker's Low. Uh, the Japanese catmint, the Nepeta subsicillis, on the far right is a very tall plant, three to four feet tall, um, and does not self-seed. The Missouri primroses, uh, the Macrocarpa is the Ozark sundrop, with big flowers about four inches in diameter. It self-seeds readily. The fireworks does not self-seed but spreads moderately. And the speciosa, the pink one, can spread pretty rampantly. So make sure you keep it contained. But good low water plants. Ornamental oreganos. Herrenhausen uh, with the uh, pinky purple clusters that stand upright. Um, the Kent Beauty with the hops-like looking uh, bracts that drape down over a rock wall is a one wonderful way to display those. And the Pilgrim that also tends to drape a little bit, so I have it sprawling down a hillside. Penstemons or beard tongues, we've got the Mexicali Mesa, the Pine Leaf Orange, and the Husker Red. Black-Eyed Susans, Henry Eilers, uh, the regular Black-Eyed Susan Fulgida, and the Cutleaf One on the far right. Salvias, cutleaf sage on the on the left, um, the perennial purple one on the center, and a plumosa that's a uh, sterile one that will not self-seed on the right. Sedums or stone crops, great low water plants. Sempervivums or hens and chicks. Um, there's a whole new series now called Chick Charms that have a lot of different colors to them that are great. I love the little uh, cobweb one on the far right, the arachnoides. Stachys or betony. We've got the big betony, the lamb's ears, and the smaller betony. Thyme, low creeping ones like the woolly thyme, the lemon thyme, and the mother of thyme on the far right. The ironweeds, lettermanii on the left. Uh, Lindheimer and Leucophila in the center with the gray foliage, and the uh, New York uh, ironweed on the far right, Novoborosensis. And Veronica's, the uh, water peri blue is a low creeper, Hocus Pocus, and uh, the, low uh, the dwarf version of Spicata nana. So I know we zipped through that very quickly, but I knew I was running out of time. So what I've got for homework for you is to design your own water-wise plot, taking some of these plants that we talked about and Make your choice, rectangular, oval here, about 12 feet long by 8 feet deep, and think about planting some of those. So even if you don't have a spot, you can dream about it. So thank you so much for your attention today.
Hello, uh, this, is, this is Jamie Beyer, uh, Master Gardener from the uh, Ames Boone area. Been a Master Gardener now for at least uh, almost 20 years, unbelievable how good time goes by. And my area of expertise is with water. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of you may have heard me speak over the years. I've done a lot of presentations across the state, actually in the Midwest, as a master gardener. That's how I get most of my hours, is by doing presentations as a master gardener. And I, most of my talks have been on water. <clears throat> so I do like questions a lot. So in this presentation, I'm not going to be able to get questions directly from you, but make sure you email me. Email me is at the end of it. My email address will be at the end of the talk, so be prepared to write that down. So it's already on, it's on the handout. Okay, super. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> the beauty of water is really quite quite exciting. Uh, they have the, the range of colors, and just in hardy water lilies, is the, the whole rainbow of, of yeah, you can imagine. Uh, even purples are available in the more tropical forms of water lilies. Everything you see in this picture are hardy water lilies. Uh, the, everything overwinters directly in the bottom of that particular pond. And uh, so just to give you an idea of the range of colors. Another thing that uh, is interesting about, for example, water lilies is that they bloom all summer long. Uh, a lot of perennials will have a two-week blooming period Actually, most perennials have a shorter blooming period, whereas hardy water lilies, their blooming period is, you know, for all summer, from basically from the first of June till frost. So, which is kind of exciting. They just keep plugging away. So, <clears throat> the range of of color is outstanding. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to be talking about today is the range of different kinds of water features that's available to us as to put in our landscapes and uh, <clears throat> there's every kind of water feature of it available that uh, that I'm going to be going over today and uh, there's <clears throat> there's a water feature I say for everybody uh, no matter what the landscape is even if you only have a deck there's a water feature for you uh, so when you add water you're not only adding the lushness of the beauty of the plants but you're also adding the potential for sound if you add a water pump you can produce sound in your garden. That's a whole other dimension in a garden, that dimension of sound. And <clears throat> some people have uh, different ways to add sound to the garden, but water is an extremely inviting thing. I can predict where people walk in my garden to where those points of sound are. They always gradu graduate to that sound. <clears throat> they will go to it. I can guarantee it. And what's interesting about adding the sound of water is that it also brings in a lot of great critters. Critters being birds, uh, all kinds of neat ones. <clears throat> and all, if you have water in your garden, and especially if you're moving the water, uh, every bird in the neighborhood will be at your garden to take a bath. And my, my gardens are really very popular places for birds to come and bathe. But you also, you also get other kinds of critters showing up. And uh, this particular type of critter shows up every spring to lay its eggs. This is an American toad. And would not believe how beautiful the song is that those guys can make. Matter of fact, they can get so loud that it can become where it's on the noisy side at times. But to me, whenever I hear the sound of toads, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a harbinger of spring to me. I always think of spring when I hear those toads singing. What's interesting about toads is that they, uh, they're a great natural predator in a garden. Uh, the toads really do not need water to exist. They do need water to reproduce in. They are more of a terrestrial amphibian. They, uh, they spend most of their time uh, in the semi-moist areas of your mulches. Like Denny talked about mulching, uh, toads love that mulch. They burrow down in there, and they're, when, they're in their gar when, you, when they're in your garden, they're eating all kinds of pests. Uh, uh, the late Russell Hara, who was a hosta hybridizer for the Des Moines area, I asked him 
one time what he did to control slugs in his garden. He said he paid neighborhood kids a buck a toad to bring, bring toads in. He'd get 20, 30 toads. And it's amazing in his garden he did not have any slug damage. Amazing. Simple and an effective way of controlling slugs. If you add water of, say, greater than 500 gallons, toads will come and, and reproduce in your garden, and you'll have toads coming out of your ears. You will not have much slug damage. There's never any, any predator that takes care of 100% of the slugs, but it would be very minimal the amount of damage. So, but now this is a you got to add water of, say, five, greater than 500 gallons. So, what a what a great natural predator. Of course, other amphibians show up. Uh, this is a um, this is a leopard frog. A leopard frogs uh, have a more of a moist skin. They have to be as closely asso associated with more water. And so they're they, they you might see them in their la your landscape, but they're going to be very very close to a high moisture situation. Their skin has to remain moist all the time. They they need that. Whereas toads, their skin is uh, uh, not, it's not necessary for the skin of them to remain moist. So, so you see leopard frogs more closely associated with water. Of course, other kinds of critters show up. Um, some that are uh, uh, that can help us. And I, I want to get into a discussion now on what are some of the techniques to eliminate mosquitoes when adding a water feature. Mosquitoes is a type of critter that can show up, and let's talk about eliminating them. Okay, so hopefully you've come up with some techniques to uh, control mosquitoes, eliminate mosquitoes in your garden. And uh, these are the three primary ways, uh, three ways to eliminate mosquitoes. And obviously adding fish, uh, they, any kind of fish actually will eat the mosquito larvae. There's, there's a type of a fish called mosquito fish. <laughs> they're real small fish, and, uh, but they're not hardy for our, our water. Uh, they don't overwinter, but there are a lot of good fish that do overwinter. Uh, goldfish and koi do overwinter in our water here, and that's a whole other subject of overwintering fish. But they will eat 100% of the mosquito larvae. There will not be any survive in water where there's fish. The second thing, if you don't want to add fish or you want a fish or pump the water, if you move the water, mosquito larvae cannot survive in water that is moving. Uh, they, mosquitoes have a small siphon tube on the back end of their abdomen that is attached to the surface tension. That's how they breathe. When the water is moving, they can't maintain that 
adherence to the surface and they drown. So when you move the water, you're going to survive. The third technique that can be used also, or if you don't want to pump or add fish, is to add mosquito bits or mosquito dunks. Those are registered trade names, uh, but it's a BT bacteria that's impregnated in Roundup corn cob. And its bacteria is safe for pets and humans. It's, uh, it's just a bacteria that infects aquatic larvae. So it's very effective. You put it in and they die. The, um, the larvae die right away. It's amazing how quickly it goes. Now, when you <clears throat> add water, you also attract dragonflies. Another name for dragonflies are mosquito hawks. So when they're flying around your garden, what they're eating are small flying insects, uh, gnats, as well as mosquitoes. So theoretically, you should have less mosquitoes in your neighbor if you manage your water right. If you're, <clears throat> you're not going to have any larvae survive in your water due to fish pumping or mosquito bits, Plus, you have dragonflies flying around eating the mosquitoes. So, theoretically, you're going to have less mosquitoes. But I don't think that will probably be the case. <laughs> but it's fun to think about. So, what a great natural predator in the garden is dragonflies. There's people out there that, uh, that, uh, that are part of a group called the Odonata Group. They, that's the only thing they're focused on is, is, is uh, studying dragonflies, learning about dragonflies. Hundreds, actually, Iowa has 108 different species of dragonflies, if you can believe it. Dragonflies and damselflies. So, and when you add water, they reproduce the water, they'll show up on their own. Here's a, here's a mosquito dunk. Uh, it's that donut-shaped thing that's floating on the surface of the water. It's easy to apply. Uh, it's Like I say, it's impregnated with the bacteria. And it dissipates in the water, and there will be no mosquito larvae existing in that water. This is a nursery tub that I have in my garden. That I, I, it's a nursery tub of plants. That there's a taro, imperial taro, growing there. That, um, but it's a nursery tub, and I, so I don't have fish in it. I don't pump the water, so I just once a month I'll throw in one of those things in those tubs, one of those mosquito dunks, and it takes care of the mosquito larvae. Just got to remember to do it. This is a picture of my girlfriend, now wife, uh, way back when in my very, very first container tub garden. My very first one. And I, you know, I, she hates me showing this picture, so <laughs> she doesn't know I'm showing it. So, <laughs> but uh, I like to show it just because of, uh, just shows how simple the thing was way back then. There's a pot of cattail in there. Uh, the spiky miniature cattail. There's a pot of uh, what they call pickerel in there, and a, a yellow water lily. What's interesting about that is I would, you know, those pots are newly planted, so I'm not really giving them justice. They really are quite, uh, they will fill the pot and they become quite lush and nice. So I'm not really doing this container much justice, but it's just a half of a 55 gallon black barrel that I got it work, cut it in half. It holds about 20 gallons of water, but it holds water. Notice there's no pump there, but I do have two fish in there to keep the mosquitoes at bay. But now, <clears throat> now I'm getting into types of water features now, and as in your handout that you have, I'm going to be going down uh, those types of water features that's available to you, so you can kind of follow along on your, your handout to see uh, different types that are available for you. Just remember, we do not have a water pump here. These are my tub gardens nowadays that I build. The, there's a tub underneath there, and I have a lot of cascading plants cascading down over the edge of the, the tub. There's That is called parrot feather. It's cascading down. Of course, you see water hyacinths, the blue blooming plant there, as well as canna. Now, Denny mentioned cannas as being a water lover, and cannas are. You can actually put cannas directly in water, and they'll do great. Now, now terrestrial cannas, there's a difference between terrestrial cannas and water cannas. Terrestrial cannas, you have to get four or five inches uh, 
up in the pot before you put it in water, whereas a, um, the water can is, you can start directly in the water. That will do very, very well. The difference between the two is the water canna has more of a blue-green foliage, whereas the uh, terrestrial cannas are more of like this particular variety. This is the same tub garden the next year with a water canna in it. Notice the bluish-green foliage on that. What's beautiful about cannas is that they just bloom their hearts out all summer long. And you can you trim those seed pods off, and they'll send up new bloom stalks all the time. It's the same tub uh, as before. Is there a way I can back this up? Backspace? Okay. It's the same tub, uh, but the next year, if you notice the vent, it's the same tub. You can change the look of your containers from one year to the next. That's the beauty of a container. You can move it. You can, you know, change what kinds of plants you have in it from one year to the next. <clears throat> now, you see the water can in here, but you also see water lettuce growing on the surface. That's a floaty, easy to plant. You just throw it on the surface of the water. Whereas the water canna is in a pot. I do have those growing in soil in a pot so that I can bring those in during the winter but still the winter. So, okay. now... I get questions on what kind of soil. It's just topsoil with those pots that those plants are in. Just regular topsoil. Uh, fertilized well, I usually cover the top of that pot with the layer of gravel to keep the fish from digging in the soil. So. Change the look from one year to the next very easily. Now on the other side of the path is this tub garden. Now notice the canna there. That's canna tropicana. That's a very commonly available canna. Also loves the water. But remember, that's a terrestrial canna. Start it uh, in a drier situation, then put it in the water after it starts growing. The taro in there, the large elephant ear plant, that's a violet stem taro. Very, very lush, tropical look. That's the beauty of water, is water. <clears throat> Plants that exist in water can, be, can afford to be lush because they have access to unlimited water. And that gives a very tropical look. The cannas, the taro, really gives a very tropical look to a garden. And on the surface of that particular tub garden are, are, is both water hyacinth and water lettuce. On the surface. Those are floaties, what I like to call floaties. Easy to plant. <laughs> now, we're <clears throat> this is a small tub container that is... Um, that is a plastic terracotta look container that has a plant in it called red stem dahlia. This particular plant is very tropical. It's a cannot overwinter in your garden, but the lushness is unbelievable. That is six foot tall, and it's an amazing plant how fast it grows. It likes a lot of fertilizer. Those stems are bright red. It brings out the terracotta look of the pot. Now, on a windy day, that could be presenting problems, but I put shepherd's hooks on the edge of that pot to keep that container from falling over. So that type of container can be vulnerable to wind. Just be aware of that sort of situation. Simple tub. Nope, there, we still do not have any water pump here. Now in there, I have to put mosquito bits to keep the mosquitoes at bay. But who, everybody can put a container like that in their garden and have that lush look. These are containers that, that, I, that I purchased through a, a local wholesaler that they, the Chinese make these things, they call them jars. They're heavily glazed inside and out. And the glazing, that heavy glazing makes them ideal, ideally suited for water. We do have a lot of heavily glazed containers that's available to us here, uh, in, you know, in, in Iowa, of course. But the most of the time, those containers are porous on the inside, and you, you need to seal those containers uh, before you add water to those. And there's a lot of good sealing agents out there. If you want to know what those are, just email me. I'll tell you what those are. The plant that now these two containers are matched but they're differently sized. Now the container on the right, it holds about two gallons of water. 
container on the left holds about a gallon. But you notice the water lily in there is planted directly in the bottom of the pots of that, of those containers, directly in the bottom. They're, they're not in pots, they're in containers. But it's, it's a miniature water lily that grows very well in a small environment. There are much, much larger water lilies that wouldn't be appropriate for this size of container. This particular water lily is adapted well for small containers. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. But also notice the small floaties in there. There's, and I'm going to show you another picture of those small floaties. There's salvinia and frog bit in there, but I'm going to show you another picture of that. Now notice the blue mist spirea that, like Denny talked about in his talk. Uh, that's the blue plant to the right. Blue mist spirea is just, it's a terrestrial plant, water-wise plant, <laughs> growing to the right. And there's malva growing to the left there. Those are not water plants. It's just uh, next to the containers. Now, this is a picture of the same container looking directly on down on top of it. That water lily is a plant called Helvola, H-E-L-V-O-L-A, a great, great container plant. Because of the size of the plant, it is the smallest of our water lilies. It grows, it's easy to grow, it's very hardy. Uh, it will, if you keep it from freezing, it'll keep, it'll overwinter very well in the bottom of a water garden or down in your basement in a plastic bag. Frog bit is the, is the uh, larger of the floaties there. Um, and then the real small floaty is a plant called salvinia. Now down south, those plants are very invasive. Here, in our freezing weather, those plants cannot survive. So it's a plant that's easily available to us. But it really adds to the texture of the water. Notice how clear the water is. And I do not have fish in these containers. Uh, but I do put mosquito bits in there to control the mosquitoes. It's easy to set up, and it goes that you still have a spot of water lilies in your, in your garden. This is Helvola in a larger environment. Those blooms are uh, silver dollar size, and at any one time you could have 30 or 40 blooms on it. But in those smaller containers, you're lucky to get four or five blooms. It's just it grows to the size of its container. So, what a display, even in a water garden, of is. <clears throat> and it's, notice how profuse the foliage is also. That diameter of that is probably about three foot. That's a big pot of ebola. Wonderful plant. Another container. This is very, very small. Very, very doable for all of us. Uh, easily uh, uh, installed. This is a... Uh, container that I bought at Kmart <laughs> and uh, put it in. It holds about maybe uh, two cups of water, maybe three cups of water. And uh, I got floaties planted in there. Uh, the water lettuce is the larger plant and the smaller plant is salvinia. Uh, salvinia you saw in the previous picture. Very easily grown. The starts are inexpensive to get in the spring. Now I do add miracle Grow fertilizer, the liquid form, you know, to that once a week to keep those green and nice. Now there is commercial fertilizers you can add to it. Uh, if you use miracle Grow the, the liquid, uh, to an open water garden, it would create green water. In this small container, there's plants gobble up that miracle Grow right away. And the amount to add is, you know, uh, a cup of miracle Grow water that you mix up, you know, like you fertilize your house plants with, a cup of that once a week, once every two weeks. And this plant will, these plants will overgrow that thing, <clears throat> and uh, it's easy to take the plants out. Give to friends. Uh, I'm always in need of more water plants, so bring it over to my place. Uh, <laughs> so whatever, you, you can throw it on the compost pile, too, if you've got so much of it. But they will grow nicely. That's the beauty of it. It's so another simple tabletop container, uh, more of a dish garden type container. Uh, this, uh, the types of plants growing in here are floaties, all floaties. There's white water fringe, the blooming white plant. There's the frilly plant, is what they call parrot feather, and the other plant in there is called the, the kind of the uh, roughly 
leaf plant is giant salvinia. You saw the previous pictures was miniature salvinia. This is giant salvinia. Uh, I do put a little bit of miracle Grow in there uh, occasionally just to keep those plants lush and nice. Simple tabletop dish garden. I love to set that in the center of picnic tables. People come over to visit. Now we've complicated it a little bit. We've added a water pump. If you look at that, you're going, well, somebody left the hydro pump. <laughs> no, no. This is a, a water feature. But there's a water pump in that watering can, and it self-circulates. <clears throat> Simple. Uh, there's no fish. There's no plants with this particular water feature. But you do have the sound of water. And anybody walking by that will be drawn to that. They'll look at that and they'll go, somebody left the hydrodote. But in this situation, obviously. And maybe you might have to add water to that once a week. I would dump that every couple weeks. Dump the water, refill it with fresh water just to keep it looking fresh. Uh, easy to do. And in the fall, you just empty that and put it in your garage. It'll be fine. little water pump in there doesn't use much power. But what complicates it is the water pump. From the standpoint, you've got to provide power to this point. All those other water features were powerless, so you could put them anywhere easy. You didn't have to put an extension cord across the ground, or you didn't have to have a plug-in next to those. What was interesting about those previous water features was what kept that water fresh and good and nice were the plants. If you do not have plants in that water, the water would become stagnant. It could become putrid if you did not have the plants. The plants keep it fresh. Whereas in this particular situation, we do not have, have plants, but what keeps the water fresh here is the water pump. Keeps it fresh. Keeps it oxygenated, as well as keeps the mosquitoes at bay. <laughs> So, but remember, you got to provide power to these points. So, um, it's uh, uh, relatively easy to do, but it's something you, you need to pay attention to. This is another uh, type of water feature. We're going to go over more types of water features that, that involve pumps now. <clears throat> this particular water feature is called a water hammer. Now, this water hammer is associated with a small waterfall. I don't want that waterfall to confuse you. It's just they have both the waterfall and the water hammer in the same picture there. But what this particular water feature does is it creates an interesting hammering sound in your garden. Some people call this a deer scare. Now, describe it a little bit because it makes a hammering sound. It water fl flows down the one bamboo pipe into the teeter totter like uh, structure, bamboo structure, and that water is cupped at that end of it. And like I say, it's on teeter totter, it's pivoted in the s towards the center of it there. And as that gets heavy, then that the right, the right half, the half that's being filled with water falls, the other end goes up, water empties out, the left end drops and it just so happens there's a small rock there that, that end of that hits and it creates a bong and and it's rhythmical and this thing can uh, <clears throat> you know fill and cycle every 30 seconds might be it depends on how fast you pump the water it could be a minute it would cycle and then you get a bang and depending upon the size of the bamboo small bamboo water hammers make a ping, <laughs> whereas the larger water hammers make more of a bong. And so this is a very popular Japanese looking sort of water feature. It's, uh, it's very popular. I see these in a lot of gardens. Now this is something that, w that does not need to be run 24 hours a day. Unless you're trying to scare deer. Now I say that tongue-in-cheek because Realistically, deer are going to investigate it. <laughs> You're not going to scare any deer with this thing. They'll they'll come check it out. <laughs> so they'll they'll 
probably browse on that Japanese maple while they're checking it out at the same time. So, but the point being is that some people do call it a deer scare, but it's <laughs> not in your wildest imagination will be scared deer. But it is an interesting uh, dimension that you can add, that sound, that rhythmic banging sound, uh, along with the sound of water movement. It's a very popular addition. Called a water hammer or deer scare. Okay. Waterfalls. Now we've, we're actually getting into um, another little bit more water movement now. We're getting into things that uh, require a little bit larger water pumps. Now this water flow in this particular waterfall is 1,200 gallons per hour, 1,200 gallons per hour. Wow, that sounds like a lot. Gee. But for waterfalls, that is on the small side. That's, uh, that's per hour. So uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, you know, it does look uh, relatively small. A bigger waterfall, more popular ones are the 3,000, the 5,000 GPH, what the gallons per hour. Uh, that's very popular size. But remember, it costs money to pump the water. There's electricity involved. So the larger the waterfall, the more expensive it costs to run those. It's amazing how well the industry has developed efficient water pumps for us. For us people that like to add water to a garden with pumps, the water pumps have become very, very efficient. There's water pumps out there that uh, what they call magnetic drive pumps that are very efficient, whereas the induced drive pumps, the more direct drive pumps, are very inefficient and use about five times the power of magnetic driven pumps. So, but even then, even with magnetic driven pumps, they still use a fair amount of power. This particular waterfall is using about one amp of power, which is not that much. It's probably 100 watts, 150 watts, but it's still running 24-7. Once you run something like this, I like to leave these run 24-7. It's for the beauty of the water, for the health of, health of the water garden, you need to leave these to run 24-7. Whereas the water hammer, you could put that on a timer and you don't have to run that in the middle of the night unless you're trying to scare deer. <laughs> I need to back that up, right? So, anyway, 1,200 gallons per hour. Here's a much, much larger waterfall. This is 18,000 gallons per hour. Much larger water pumps. We're talking um, electrical usage of probably $40 a month, maybe, maybe $30 a month when you run that. Uh, so it's it's expensive, uh, but what a sight! Uh, that is very in, and it, it, that's very inviting, and it brings it brings people in from far and wide to see that. It's a very pretty waterfall. Just remember, eighteen thousand gallons per hour. The water lily in front is a hardy water lily called Glastonia. Now I say a hardy water lily; those are water lilies that overwinter. Uh, below our ice levels here in Iowa. The, there's cattails on either side of that waterfall. That's a variegated cattail to die for cattail. Beautiful, beautiful plant. And you can see some water hyacinths to the left and elephant ear further to the left there. Okay. I just want to ask the question, or what are the best locations to place a water garden or a water feature. So think about it. Get in your groups and think about it.
So, now, what's interesting about water, uh, you put a lot of effort into these things. A lot of, when I say a lot of effort, uh, you, you know, you're, it's, a, it's an important piece that you put some time into. Why not put these things up close and personal? Uh, if you put it uh, near an entryway, along a path, into a sitting bench, are all very good locations. Uh, I'm really, really big on putting them near decks. The decks are a very popular addition to our outdoor living areas and a water garden right off of a deck where you can stand on the deck and feed, uh, feed your fish right off the side of the deck is very popular. Setting a tub garden or a container garden on top of the deck is also very exciting and easy to do. Next to a front door works really good. Next to a back door to a pathway. You notice my tub gardens I put on either side of my pathway going back into my garden. I didn't have power to those points if you remember those pictures, but that's where I located those. Now, if you do have a spot in the back 40 uh, that you think you might want to put a water garden, it's not a good choice just because you've got all this effort and people are um, will not generally go back there to see it unless you have a loud waterfall. <laughs> if you have a loud waterfall, they might venture back there, but it is more of an effort for them to to, uh, to, to go back there. So I generally avoid the back 40 locations. Uh, it only makes sense. For example, um, uh, Ames City Hall, uh, we put a rock fountain in this Ames City Hall. They had that originally in the back part of the courtyard. They says, oh, let's move it right up next to the picnic man, that was the spot to put it. That was a perfect spot. People sit next to the picnic table right next to that bubbling rock. Very, very nice way to, uh, to add water right up close and personal. Now we're talking about different kinds of fountains. Uh, this is what they call a splash fountain or, um, or a pondless waterfall, pondless fountain. Different terms for these things. But this is a drilled rock that uh, water is, pumps up through. Underneath that rock is an underground uh, container, a container that holds maybe 20 or 30 gallons. It's underneath there. On top of that container, underground container, is a grating, and the water pumps down in that container, and then it pumps up through the rock, cascades down, back down. So it circulates uh, very nicely. Uh, this one of these things, I've seen these things run all summer long without being filled with water. It's risky. I'd probably check it uh, once every couple weeks, make sure it's filled up if we don't get any rain, of course. And, uh, make sure it's got water in it. But it's very low maintenance. You do need to set it up in the spring and tear it down the fall, take your water pump out. You do not want ice getting to that water pump. So, very easily. Now, you do remember, you have the sound of, a, of splashing water here. Very inviting, but one, one thing I want to point out here is notice that there's really not any algae growing on that stone. And I always pose the question is why isn't there algae growing on that stone? Notice the hostas in there. It's a very heavily shaded location, so you have less algae growing on that particular water feature. Algae can become a problem. A lot of people want to scrub those things off all the time, but in this situation, the shadier situation, you don't have to worry about the algae so much. There are different products you can add to the water to kill the algae. You can actually add bleach uh, to it, um, but just make sure your pets aren't, birds aren't drinking out of it when you add that bleach. Um, it's, that can be lethal. But there are non-lethal algae killers also you can add to it. Okay, shady situation. Notice this particular splash fountain is notice the algae on that urn that really adds to the beauty of it. This is the same sort of fountain as that rock fountain, except it's an urn instead of a rock. That urn's got a hole drilled in the bottom of it, and the water pumps up through it and cascades down over the sides of that urn. What's interesting is the algae does give it a look of age. I would never in a million years want that algae scrubbed off. That is, really is an inviting uh, water feature. It almost looks like that urn's been painted <laughs> with green, but very inviting. Uh, remember, you have that sound there. Now, you can change this 
feature. From one year to the next, you can put a rock on top of it, and take the urn away and put a rock on top of it, and have water cascading over the rock. The algae there, some people wouldn't want that, but I, I like it in particular. Some people wouldn't like it. Everybody's different in what their likes and dislikes. But remember, there's an underground reservoir there that holds maybe 20 or 30 gallons that pumps down underneath there. There's a way to access that. As you pull, there's usually a trap door underneath one point of that. You pull a few stones away and you can access the water pump. Make sure it's running good just by different, an access point. But it's hidden. Actually, one of the flatter stones, the water pump could be underneath one of those flat stones, for example. It's easy to access. Have the sound of water. This is another splash fountain that uh, just a little different style with a, a hand pump, old style hand pump. Uh, what a great addition to a garden. And some people like this particular style. Uh, an urn might be your style. This is more my style. I love this kind of small fountain. Uh, easily piped. The flow here, by the way, is probably in the neighborhood of 500 gallons per hour, maybe 400 gallons per hour. Very, very slow flow. Very inexpensive to run power-wise. We do not have to worry about mosquitoes in this kind of environment because we're pumping it. This is a more of a Japanese-looking garden. Uh, again, splash fountain. The depth of that water is only a few inches. Uh, they've dyed the water black to really give it a, a really dark look to it. You know, Mexican beach pebbles, the stone around there really gives it a very Japanese look with the uh, um, with the ladle and the bamboo spikes around there. Some people like this particular kind of style. Now we're getting into, getting into more formal gardens, uh, more formal fountains. This is a formal versus informal is kind of an interesting concept that we I just briefly want to talk about. Formal, the lines are very predictable in a formal garden. Notice the edging on this thing is very predictable. You know, uh, yeah, lines are very straight. And even the fountains in here are more formal. These are what they call bell fountains. Uh, those bell fountains are high maintenance. A chunk of algae or something uh, plugs part of that fountain head, then that bell is no longer a nice bell. It's misshapen. You have to get in there and clean that little chunk of algae out of there. But if you filter the water heavily, and then it's not as much maintenance <clears throat> from the standpoint of, of maintaining those bell fountains. So just FYI, very formal bell fountain. This is a formal fountain itself. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the whole thing is designed around this uh, centerpiece fountain. Uh, notice the predictable lines in this formal fountain. Um, <clears throat> by the way, water lilies do not like water on an upper surface of their leaves all the time. So it actually will, will harm water lilies to have fountain splash on top of those water lily leaves. And the reason being is that uh, water lily leaves, their breathing holes are on their upper surface of their leaf. Whereas terrestrial plants, their breathing holes, their stoma, are on the underside of their leaf. And uh, water lilies, their stoma are on the upper surface of the leaf. So if there's water on those leaves all the time, it'll actually suffocate them. If you notice the leaves towards the center there where the water's cascading on them, notice the leaf, they're yellow. That's because the water's on those leaves all the time. So, okay. Just remember, if you have a fountain in there, uh, you might want to shut the fountain down at night uh, and then give those plants a chance to breathe. These are very, uh, very high-end fountains. Um, the, uh, those are like two horsepower type fountains. It uses a lot of power. Uh, you see these in retention ponds a lot, uh, just to add an element of interest. Uh, you can see these from a distance. These are very expensive to run. What I like to talk about primarily with these fountains is the expense as well as on a windy day that fountain water can actually almost reach shore. In this situation it's not that big a deal but if you have a high fountain in your water garden on a windy day you can actually empty your water garden <laughs> by the wind blowing the water out. So, so whatever fountain you use in a water garden uh, 
make sure the height of it is not very tall so for the wind to blow it out. Okay? Just remember that. This is a uh, fountain that's uh, made out of a millstone. Uh, this is a um, one that um, is easily installed. The flow here is about 3,500 gallons per hour. That stone is, is placed very level, so the water cascades over the edges of that stone evenly. If that millstone was tipped in any way, it would uh, you know, flow off one side. It wouldn't look as good. It needs to be absolutely level. This is the start of a stream. Uh, remember the 3,500 3, gallons per hour? So that stream is, flows pretty good. And um, notice the algae growing on that millstone. I, I, I love that algae look on there. Personally, I like that look. Some people have different tastes. They want to scrub that off, but I like that a lot. Easily done, a very popular addition to, to gardens is millstone fountains. And, of course, um, a regular informal water garden. This is my own water garden a number of years back. Uh, there's almost every plant in there, almost every plant is hardy. There is um, a couple tropical water lilies to the right there, the red ones. Those are tropical water lilies. Those red-leaved water lilies, that's a red water lily called red flare. It's tropical. Uh, those, I can't overwinter there. But everything else overwinters in that water garden. The lotus to the left, the variegated sweet flag, the pickerel. The, there is a thalia in there, but that's the hardy thalia. The one directly in the center in the back, that's hardy thalia. Primrose creeper, lots of great plants there. So the beauty of it is they overwinter right in that pond, directly in the bottom of that pond. That's a two and a half foot deep pond. I put those plants on the bottom of that pond and they overwinter. They're beneath the ice layer by just placing them on the bottom of that water. Very lush look. <clears throat> Remember, water plants can afford to be lush. And of course, fish. Um, this uh, particular uh, type of fish is a fish called a calico shubunka. Now, these are hardy for Iowa. These fish are uh, obviously calico colored. The base color should be blue in a typical calico shubunkan. But uh, this is a particular type of fish that I like. I raise a lot of these myself. They, they've got to have the long fins. That's the shabunkan look. It's the long flowing fins. And of course the calico. Um, this uh, particular, I still have most of those fish. And this, this picture is probably 10 years old. I still have most of those fish in my water. They can live 20, 30 years, these, these calico shabunkan. And like I say, they're hardy for Iowa water. And of course, when most people think of fish for water gardens, they think of Japanese koi, or koi in general, and that's what these fish are. These are Japanese koi. There's American koi, there's Israel koi, there's all kinds of different nationalities of koi. <clears throat> but some, some koi uh, can be worth thousands of dollars easily. There's a couple fish in there worth $5,000 a fish. Can you believe it? $5,000 a fish. A grand champion koi in Japan can sell for over a million and a half dollars. Phenomenal dollars. Phenomenal. Phenomenal dollars. So <clears throat> uh, you do not want these things dying. So when you get to this point where you're keeping high-end Japanese koi, you want to know your stuff. And you want good filters. You want uh, you want to know how to overwinter them. The shibunkans uh, are easily easily overwinter too, and they're not quite as valuable. <laughs> so you know, ten twenty dollars for a big shibunkan would be a high end shibunkan fish. What makes them valuable is the type of coloration where it's placed, where that color is, how distinct it is. Uh, it, in each variety of, of fish, for example, that black and white one there is called a, a, sh a shiro, a shiro yuzuri, shiro yuzuri. Uh, the fish, uh, there's uh, a kohaku in there, all Japanese terms. Really gets interesting 
uh, when it talks about the varieties of fish. And try to remember those. <laughs> it's taken me a lot of years, and I still don't have them all down. This is a night shot of my water garden at night, moonlit night. Notice the reflection of the moon off the surface of the planet. This particular variety of water lily is called white night. It blooms at night. The bloom actually opens at about, oh, 7 o'clock in the evening. It's still light. And then it will be open all night long and then close at about 10 o'clock in the morning, 9 or 10 o'clock. So you still get benefit of seeing the bloom during daylight hours. But it's a, an interesting way of, uh, of it, it attracts night insects to pollinate itself. This is a tropical water lily. does not overwinter well in our water. It doesn't it winter at all in our water gardens. But what a beautiful shot. It's exciting to just spend time out the water. At night, you remember you're hearing the sound of water when you're standing there. So feel free to give me an email uh, if you uh, want to have have any questions. Uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. I'll take time to talk to you. So just remember, it's a lot of fun. Wonderful. Thank you so much to Jamie and Denny for our presentation on water today. Just a reminder to fill out your evaluation form before you head out. And we look forward to seeing you next time to talk about pollinators and growing herbs. Thanks so much for taking the time today.